don't have a great track record when it comes to solving problems of human behavior or when it comes to helping people live happier, more productive lives. We're just not that good at it. We are good at blaming people, punishing them for doing something or not doing something and incarcerating them. We're good at that, but we're not good at solving the underlying behavioral problems that we're faced with. Now, maybe that's not our fault. The blame and punish model is so ingrained in our society. In fact, the Supreme Court has even written that free will and our ability to blame and punish someone for doing something when they could have done something else sits at the heart of our criminal justice system. But that needs to change. We need to let go of blame and punish and embrace a causal model for understanding our behavior. And this is a view that I'm going to advocate for here today, and I hope to illustrate for you the power of thinking this way through a couple of examples. But first, it begs the question, what is the causal view? If we let go of free will and blame and punish, what controls our behavior? Three things. Your genetic and neurobiological makeup, which was endowed to you by your ancestors. Everything you've ever experienced, sometimes we'll call this your behavioral history, and present circumstance, everything from your blood sugar to the people who are around you. That's it. And if you think hard about it, there's no part of you, and there's no part of your behavior can be free of these things. So what happens if we can think this way? What happens if we can let go of blame and punish and embrace causality? Well, I think it can result in far-reaching social change. So let's try an example. Over the last couple of decades, opioid addiction has come to plague this country. But the way that we view it, and indeed the way that we view all substance abuse-related disorders, has changed dramatically. Instead of blaming the addict, they took the drug, they could have done something else. We now call addiction a disease. And make no mistake, when we call a behavior, and that's what drug-seeking and drug-taking is, behavior, when we call a behavior a disease, what we mean is that the factors that cause that behavior are outside of the person's control. We understand opioid addiction to be controlled by a person's genetic and neurobiological makeup. Perhaps they are predisposed to addiction, predisposed to be ultra-sensitive to a powerful opioid drug reinforcer. We understand it to be controlled by all the experiences the person has taking the drug and the context in which the person's used the drug and the way that those experiences have interacted with and changed the person's neurobiology. And we understand it to be controlled by the person's present circumstances. Um, everything from how long the person's been without the drug to how immediately available is the drug now and how available are other non-drug alternatives. And when we do this, it moves our focus from the person to the underlying problem. Right, the underlying behavioral problem. And we do seemingly crazy things. We help the person take the drug safely as a part of effective treatment. We pay them not to take the drug. This would be impossible in a blame and punish view. But it's effective and it helps people. Imagine all the lives we could have saved and the pain that families could have avoided. If we could think about addiction behavior like this from the start and if we can think more broadly about it this way now. Because, but here's the thing, you know, addiction behavior is just behavior. All behavior is caused by these underlying factors. Now, in the case of opioid addiction, the uh, controlling variable is an obvious and potent drug reinforcer, but all behavior is controlled by these things, however subtly, and that's what's important about what I'm, the point I'm trying to make today, right? We need to shift to thinking about all of our behavior this way. I mean, imagine if we could think about things like poverty and homelessness and unemployment and bad academic performance, bad grades, in terms of environmental and circumstantial cause instead of moral failing. For example, if you think that poor people remain poor because they are lazy, then you're using our blame and punish model, our blame and punish view, right? They're at fault. But if you think poor people remain poor because of where they live, what their parents did for a living, if they had their parents around, because of limited access to opportunity, and because 
they live in a fundamentally different financial world with a fundamentally different set of rules than probably any of us in this room. Now you're thinking circumstantially. Now you're thinking environmentally. And you're in a better position to solve the problem because you understand the variables that control behavior. Well, probably the best example, the most powerful example of this way of thinking comes from my field, behavior analysis, where thinking this way is commonplace, where we're trained to think this way. Yeah. And we, we apply it to research and theory and practice and to solving real-world problems. And one area where we've been particularly effective is the treatment of severe intellectual and developmental disabilities. This is a population of folks that we as a society didn't know what to do with, so we institutionalized them. We stripped them of all their rights, we stripped them of all their dignity, we stripped them of all their independence, we electrocuted them indiscriminately, we surgically destroyed parts of their brains to make them easier to handle, and we drugged them until they were shells of themselves, walking zombies. But then a group of people saved them. At first, it was just a small group of scientists working in clinical settings, but now we call these people applied behavior analysts. Somewhere in the world right now, there's an applied behavior analyst telling teary-eyed parents that their child is not the problem. The system and the circumstance and the environment are the problem. And then like magic, although really with just an understanding of basic behavioral principles, they teach the child to sit quietly and eat, to stop banging his head on the concrete 357 times a day, to stop eating the furniture, to appropriately request for food and attention, toys. The child regains independence. The child might even get back into a regular school classroom and live a life that seemed impossible just a short time ago. And now the parents cry with joy, and they tell other parents, and a movement grows. It's a graph that shows the number of applied behavior analysts working in the world from 1999 to 2018. And according to the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, there are currently 32,008 certified applied behavior analysts working in the world today, and that is up from 28 in 1999. 28. The demand for behavior analytic services the demand for this way of thinking and the number of applied behavior analysts working in the world is growing exponentially, literally exponentially. This is a success story. And it is because applied behavior analysts do not ascribe to a blame and punish model. Applied behavior analysts ascribe to a circumstantial environmental causal model for understanding behavior. Find the cause, change the cause, change the behavior, and solve the problem. It's powerful. This way of thinking is powerful. It transforms lives. It transforms the lives of individuals. It transforms the lives of families. It transforms the lives of entire communities. And it's liberating. It's so liberating to think this way. I tell my students that there's a lot of freedom in letting go of free will and blame and punish. I believe that. It's liberating to move your focus from the person, to even forgive the person, and try to understand the underlying behavioral problem. Now, it isn't easy. It isn't easy to do this. It takes work. It takes practice. But it's effective. It helps us understand big things. We've talked about some. Addiction, developmental disabilities, homelessness, poverty, bad academic performance. It helps us understand things like violence, hate, bias, ignorance. We move our focus from the person to the problem, changes our perspective. And when we do this, we can understand how to solve problems. Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have laws, and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't hold people accountable for their behavior. These are important contingencies that help us shape the kinds of behaviors that we want to see more and less of as a society. And it doesn't make certain behaviors any less appalling. But it does change the way we view the causes of those behaviors. 
and I think it changes the policies that we would choose to pursue. And it fundamentally changes the way that we view social and criminal justice in our country. Because when we understand behavior and its causes, we can change behavior, ours and others. And thinking this way moves us away from the person and it moves us towards empathy, understanding, circumstance, environment, cause, and to the true root of the problem. And ultimately, the problem is what we want to understand and solve. Thank you.